Hey, I'm Alicia Bake. I'm Jen Greenfield. And I'm Jen Tifoni. VO Booth Besties listen to the questions you have. We find pros in the know to help you learn. And connect with our amazing VO community. Welcome, Welcome to, to VO, VO Booth, Booth Besties. Besties. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, everyone, to VO Booth Besties. Like our intro said, we're here to help working voice actors get your most important questions answered by industry pros who know. Each week, we have a new topic and a guest speaker who is an expert on that topic. You can submit your questions through our website, boothbesties.com, and we'll do our best to include them in our interview. A quick bit of housekeeping. In order to stay on topic and get as many of your questions answered as we can, we're actually going to keep hand raising turned off. However, the chat will remain open, and this week, AB will be monitoring that. Now, without further ado, let's meet our guest. Over to you, JT. Thank you, NJ. This week, we are thrilled to have Paul Schmidt with us. Paul is a Virginia-based commercial voice actor and corporate narrator. His career in performance started at the age of six when he played God in a first-grade production. That's like a big first role. Go big or go home, right? <laughs> and he continued to perform any chance he could get. Over time, this landed him in the wonderful world of radio, much like me. You still have any air check tapes around, Paul? Those will humble you right up, man. He also has a weekly newsletter that is meant to move, touch, and inspire. It has a significant social following on... Um, on social media, and every week that community looks forward to Paul's informative YouTube videos. Though he is full-time in VO, he has used his extensive sales and marketing background and has become a business and marketing coach for our community. He's even developed an all-encompassing marketing program called the VO Freedom Master Plan. Paul's why is his teenage son. And fun fact, Paul actually used to do stand-up and ran a comedy club. <laughs> Over to you, NJ. Paul, thank how are you. you? It's, it's great to be here. Thank you for asking me. And I am just, if I were any better, I'd fall over. So oh, thank, thanks for having me. Sit down now because it's going to be <laughs> fun. Uh, okay, no, so for real, did you really used to do stand up and you ran a comedy club? That rumor is true. Yes. <laughs> and so, so essentially, I'm that schmuck that started a comedy club just to get stage time. And so I ran a, owned and operated a, a comedy club in Dover, Delaware for about three and a half years called Christina's Comedy Zone. And it was named after my then wife so that I could get buy-in on said comedy zone. <laughs> I actually was there. I didn't know that was you. Get out of here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My that, husband's that... best friend lives near Dover and we went with him. Wow. That's okay, the world just got really small. Jen, you didn't <laughs> tell me that before, <laughs> before I brought this up. That is wild. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize that was it. Yep, at Dover cool. Downs, uh, uh, Hotel and Casino, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's been a few years. Uh, I shut it down when right after my son was born, and he just turned 16. So that'll give you an idea. Yep, I think, I think we were there maybe the first year. Because we were still dating. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, well, memories. welcome to VO community. And <laughs> we can narrow it down very quickly, all of our connections. Well, Paul, we are not going to wait any longer. Let's jump into this. I know you and I, oh my gosh, we have a huge passion for marketing. And I am so excited for everyone to hear just all they can learn from you in an hour uh, on how we can really grow our business using using direct marketing. So let's start easy. What okay. is direct marketing? And do I really have to do it? Well, you know, as <laughs> as it's it's the same answer to every question in voiceover. It depends, right? Uh, first of all, let's start with what is direct marketing, and it is something that, for the most part, did not exist 20 years ago. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you were either union and you had an agent and you auditioned and that's how you got your work or you weren't union and you didn't audition much and you didn't get much work uh, at all. And so uh, that was the way the world was for decades and decades until, you know, the 21st century hit and specifically things like YouTube and 
later on TikTok and the rise of corporate video and every every corporation began to understand the power of video and video marketing and not every corporation wanted to deal with quite frankly and this is not a knock against the union it's just very complex right and not everybody wants to have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get a you know thousand dollar explainer done and so since about 2005, 2007 or so, we've seen the rise of the freelance non-union voice actor. And what that means is we can now go get work directly from the client. Some work, not all genres, uh, but there's a lot of especially corporate work out there that you not only don't need an agent for now, but most agents don't even deal with it. Um, so a lot of that work can be gotten directly. Uh, but the problem is we've been kind of a battleship. We've been very slow to turn and teach people how to do the work that we so adeptly teach them how to do, right? We're great at teaching them how to do the work, not so much on how to find the work. Right. That makes sense? Yep. Now, do you need to do it? Well, if you would like to work a lot, if you would like to grow your business, uh, that is one way to go about it. And the reason that I tout direct marketing so much, there, there are a few reasons. Number one, that's the primarily the way I built my business. Um, I spent, when I decided I wanted to go full time years ago, I spent six months just building the plan because I knew that, uh, number one, this, this is a numbers game and you've got to reach out to people uh, at scale. Um, you got to start a lot of conversations. Uh, because there is there's waste, right? For every two people you reach out to, uh, only one's going to open your email, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're already at fifty percent capacity right there. Um, and so I knew I needed to build a marketing machine. I needed the tools and the processes to do that. And so I spent six months doing that, putting the tools and processes in place, working out my messaging, uh, upping the game in my website and on my demos and getting better coaching and you know just trying to up my not only my performance game but certainly my business game because while i had pursued clients uh you know i had a day job and i that took up a lot of time and voiceover was a really really great part-time job for me uh but but i you know the more i i worked in the corporate world the less i enjoyed it and it just became awful uh, near the end. And I decided, you know what, man, if I can go get my own work in this business, I think I can make this work. And that's what I did. Okay. So, no, keep going. Keep going. No, I was just going to say, so do you have to direct market? Uh, I think it's a great way to grow your business. It is the best way to control your relationships, own the relationships with the people that are making the decisions to hire you. Uh, it's the best way to build repeat business because you own those relationships. Uh, it is slower in some ways and it is faster in some ways. Uh, it Once you get a client through direct marketing, you typically either won't audition because they will hand you work because you've done work for them in the past and they like you and they, mm -hmm. you know, they love your work and you have a great relationship, uh, or you will be auditioning for probably, I don't know, like a fraction of what you might audition against in the pay to plays in terms of competition, right? right. Uh, certainly, you know, if I get if I get an audition in, let's say it's a a, a national spot for uh, whatever it might be from one of my agents, I might be one of two or two hundred and fifty people submitting to my agent, right? And there might be five or six agencies on that casting, so I'm going to be in a pile if they even make it past my agent, right? Yeah. So now if you get on a corporate roster, you might be one of six, 10, 20, 35 corporate voice actors that they have a relationship with. Corporate rosters tend to be a lot smaller. Um, the competition, it tends to be a lot smaller. And so, you know, it's much easier to, even when you have to audition, your booking ratios go up, right? Because you're, you're, you're playing in, in many, many, many more smaller pools. Does that make sense? It does. And the one word I know we're going to hear over and over and over throughout this clubhouse is relationship. Yep. And that is just going to be one of the key factors here. Um, you know, 
I don't have to tell you, I'm a little bit putting words in your mouth that mar direct marketing is not a one and done. <laughs> I mean, it is not a, I send the email and they, they liked me and it's done. <laughs> it's uh, just, it's just not. <laughs> you know, and I talk to, as you might imagine, I talk to voice actors every single day. Yeah. And when I ask them, you know, uh, tell me, tell me about, uh, any, you know, any direct marketing you're doing. They say, well, you know, a lot of times what I hear is, well, you know, I got a big list of people and I reached out to like 700 of them and I didn't get anything and they're shocked. And I say, well, how, how did you follow up? And they say, excuse me? Or they say, follow up? <laughs> yep. as, if to, as if to say, oh, I reached out to them once and I just expect them to hand me work after that. No. First of all, if you reach out to somebody one time, the sheer odds of them having a project ready to go, for which <laughs> you might be a fit at that exact moment in time are astronomical, right? They just are. It's happened to me a few times, um, but it's, you know, it's happened to me because I reach out to hundreds and hundreds of people a day. I hope right? you bought so a lottery ticket that day too, because <laughs> luck was on your side, my friend. That's right. That's right. But most voice actors don't understand that one sit up will not make you fit, right? You can't reach out to, I don't care how many people it is, one time and expect them to remember you four months down the line or two years or five years down the line when a project comes up that you might be a fit for. You've got to start and then keep at that relationship, right? You've got to, the whole point of direct marketing is to begin, yes, digitally a relationship with somebody so that when a project comes up, you're top of mind. Yep. So let's say I'm a voice actor and I'm, I, you have inspired me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready okay. to start direct marketing. What do you think actors should have in place, if anything at all, other than a heap load of confidence, um, what do you think they should have in place before they start direct marketing? For example, do we, do I need to have a demo prepared? Do I need to just have samples? Do I just need to have a great hook? <laughs> and that's all I need. What do you think? So there's a lot of stuff you need and some stuff you don't, right? So at the bare minimum, and I ask for people for this, uh, you know, even before they sign up for a strategy call with me, at the bare minimum, you need solid basic training. And I don't mean you took a weekend webinar. I mean, you've been training for months, not weeks, and you're competent, right? You need professional demos uh, because if you're going to ask people for work and you're going to be com competing against other professional voice actors, then you need to be, by definition, competitive. And those demos need to be competitive, which goes back to my first point, training. And my second point, don't ever produce your own demos. Dear God, I've been producing broadcast quality audio for since I was 20 years old and I'm 55. So what's that, 35 years? And I still don't do my own demos. And the reason is uh, I'm too close to the mural, right? It's uh, when, when, you, when you get a demo done, you need someone else to direct you, to write your scripts, to get the best performance out of you. Someone who's experienced at the art of showing an actor's range through the production. Somebody who's experienced at uh, highlighting the actor and their range and their voice and their acting ability but not overshadowing it with the production. Um, and so you, all those roles you offload when you do a produ pro professional demo so that you can concentrate on the part that you're supposed to do the best, and that is the performance, right? So that's why whenever you do a demo, do a professional demo, in my opinion. Um, so those two things, you, you know, you're, you're, typically it's a commercial and a narration demo, uh, which is going to cover a lot of the professional uh, corporate work that you're going to be going after, um, and, and a solid website. And so many of the websites I see, uh, especially from newer voice talent, and this isn't a criticism, it's just a fact, look like they went on Wix and moved a few pictures around and maybe put up a demo somewhere on the page. And, you know, it just looks hacky and amateurish and cheap. And you can use a, web, a website builder like Wix or Squarespace. I use Squarespace myself. Um, but, you know, if you're not experienced in website design, it will show, right? So pay somebody, uh, you know, be professional, look professional. Um, 
demos, website, and then the big three after that are tools, processes, and messaging. Okay. You ha- you have to have all three nailed down because again, if you're going to market in sufficient number, and I hear a lot of other coaches with all due respect say, well, you've got to reach out to at least 10 people a day. And I go, well, that, yeah, if you want to build your business in 40 years, uh, I didn't have that kind of time, right? Uh, in my opinion, you've got to be reaching out to hundreds of people a day. And to do that, uh, without it taking up all day, you've got to have a system. You've got to have a plan, and you've got to have the tools and processes to support that plan. Um, tools like a CRM, uh, Customer Relationship Management Software. Some of the common ones are HubSpot or Voice Overview. Um, and that, you know, everybody everybody that's new to this uh, kind of comes in and goes, well, I've got all my contacts in an Excel spreadsheet. Great. That's going to work for the first hundred. But after that, it's going to get really unwieldy and you're going to spend all your time working with your uh, with your Excel spreadsheet. So uh, you need a CRM. It, it's not as important which one you use as it is that you use one. But it's just like a it's just like a DAW in, in that regard. You know, Reaper, uh, Adobe Audition, Studio One, whatever you use, they all do about the same job. So you pick the one that's most intuitive for you and the easiest for you to use so that you have command of it and you can use it like any tool the way that you want to. It's the same way for CRM. Uh, The second thing is you need a way and a system to be able to find and qualify leads quickly. And that is, okay, you need to understand who you're going after, what they're, and when I say who, Jen, I don't mean companies. I mean people. I mean individual people because companies don't hire you. Right. Uh, people hire you. Somebody, somebody in that company is going to make the decision to hire you or not. And not um, always, and not, sorry to interrupt you. And this is the other thing that people have to remember too. Oftentimes the company has outsourced it anyway. So you could be yep. reaching out to someone within the company, but they're using an advertising agency, a marketing agency, a local production house. You know, yep. you've got to do your research. Go on. Well, and sometimes, you know, you just flat out ask them and, and, you know, you leave it open. Hey, if you have a partner you work with and you can you point me in their direction, great. And that's a conversation. And that's really all we're trying to have. Uh, so oftentimes, it's impossible to know without exhaustive research. And when I say exhaustive, if you're spending five to 10 minutes on one contact, that's exhaustive. Because mm-hmm. if you have to do that hundreds of times a day, you will spend your entire life doing nothing but research and marketing. And you can't do that. It's not sustainable. So people are going to ask, I mean, it, it's the next question. So ha, ha, who am I reaching out to? How am I finding leads? Am I just Googling people in my area? Am I Googling my favorite company and going on LinkedIn? Like, it, it, you know, you talk about tools and resources and I would add to that strategy and you, cause you speak to that a lot. Like wh- how I'm just throwing it out there. What do I do? LinkedIn is a fantastic way to tar- identify and target leads. Okay. Uh, because because even in, in the free version of LinkedIn, and I used a, a sales navigator for a long time because it's got a little bit more granular search, but it's pricey. It's like 90 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the free version, you can still search by jo- job title and geography and be able to nail things, you know, to, to narrow things down. And then you need a way because LinkedIn is a great search engine mm-hmm. for finding leads. It is, uh, it's a great database. It's a great way to interact with people online uh, in terms of when they post content, to be able to comment on that and to be able to grow that part of the relationship uh, socially. So it's a little bit of a social network. It's a great search engine. What it is typically not, in my opinion, is a great communita- communications platform. Okay. Because only one in seven LinkedIn users use the platform even weekly. Right. So when you send somebody a message on LinkedIn, you really have no idea if and when they're going to get it. Right. They might be a twice a month user um, and that message may have aged. Right. So it's it's really it's a very slow platform because not everybody uses it daily. And that's why I highly, highly recommend and built my business on email. OK, uh, because email is scalable. You can send a lot of email messages if you know what you're doing the right way. Uh, at scale, 
and and directly one on one. I'm not talking about things like Mailchimp or Constant Contact. Those are marketing emails. Those are email blasts. Those are you're going to pick a thousand people and send them all the same thing, and it's going to look very corporate and not very personal, and uh, it's not very effective, right? Because you can't start a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, they they can't really reply, right? You can't really get back to them when they do reply. So you need to be sending uh, s emails that are more uh, from a sales approach than a marketing approach. And that means a more one-on-one -on -one approach, more more personalized than what you would do from a marketing approach. Um, so tools, processes, messaging. Uh, you've got to work out your messaging ahead of time. That means what am I going to, what am I going to say to the, you know, if, if I reach out to you, Jen, I need to know exactly what I'm going to say to you the first time what I'm going to say to you in the follow-up and what I'm going to say to you in every follow-up from then on. And I want to follow up with you, not for weeks, but for years, right? Because it might take that long for you to have a project that, uh, that I'm right for. Right. Right. But when it comes up, I want to be on that list that you're going to call. So again, one of the things that, um, you know, I'm a proponent of is starting local, like, who who's around you? Where do you shop? Where are you spending your money? Um, who do you follow on social media? Um, you know, trying to, cause again, it, one of the things, you know, this, that so many voice actors do is we'll watch the Super Bowl, at, you know, ads, right. And we're like, I want to do that. Okay. That's awesome. We all want the national ad, but <laughs> there's also something to be said for, supporting local. And again, when people keep, they get really intimidated by this idea of I need to be doing 10, 20, a hundred leads a day or so many a week, you know, it's, I don't even know where to begin. And so for me, I encourage people to go to start local. So would, do you share that sentiment? Do you go big? What do you do? I go big because I've been doing this for years. I okay. think if you, I think, I think starting local has a place. Okay. Meaning that when you're getting your tools, your processes, your systems, and your messaging down, it's good to start small and local because as you start to do this, you need to build confidence in those things. You need to build confidence that your tools are working the way that you've set them up to. You need, you need confidence that your systems are working the way they're supposed to, right? Uh, that when somebody gets an email, it looks like it came from a person because it really right. did, right? You're just scaling it. Uh, and, and so you need to build confidence in all of those things. If you're, you know, once you've got uh, uh, your, you know, you use it to work your local contacts, right? That's a good small place. But unless you work in New York or LA, uh, your local market is not enough to support you. No, it that's fair. Yeah, that's right? fair. That's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, not for, certainly not for a full-time income. You've got to be pulling work from all over the country. And in, you know, I mean, I've got you know, clients in, I think 12 countries. Okay. So, uh, you know, we're not limited by geography anymore. Like we used to be. Right. Uh, do you even find, less so since the pandemic. Do you find that, uh, so I, I a hundred percent hear you, uh, on your opinion on LinkedIn messaging and of course, email just being like the go-to, but do you ever find yourself sliding into DMS on socials? And I know you're not a fan, you, you, because of the, the, the scalability cold calling isn't your thing, but maybe could you speak to it? Cause I know some people have considered it or are kind of on the fence and maybe you can kind of tip them one way or another on DMS and socials and cold calling. Okay, so let's start with cold calling. I find cold calling highly, highly, highly inefficient. There are some people I know that uh, that's the way they built their business. Uh, Brian Doucet is a big pro proponent of cold calling. Uh, and I would never try and talk him out of it because it works for him. For me, uh, when I started my uh, full-time business, I already had a full-time day gig, uh, which I hated but needed. And so from eight to five every day, I couldn't cold call. I couldn't spend time emailing prospects. I had to figure out how to get this done at four and five o'clock in the morning and how to do it at seven and eight and nine o'clock at night, right? So email was the best option for me. Email is also, as I said before, highly scalable, right? You can send a lot of emails in a very short amount of time, but there's only so many people you can call in a given hour. Um, the second reason is I believe it's highly inefficient. Depending on which numbers you believe, 
it takes about these days 18 phone calls to get somebody on the line. I don't mean that one specific person. I mean, if you call 18 people, you'll get one person live picking up. And so that's highly inefficient. And you, you, I've said this a million times, a voice actor and an entrepreneur, your most valuable asset is your time. And how you choose to spend that time is the biggest decision you make on an ongoing basis every single day. And yeah. that's why I, I don't... Uh, People, you know, there are some people that love cold calling. I'm not one of them. Yeah. All right. Well, and that's why we're here. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're bringing you, you know, the point of VOBB is to, and we say this every week, but we may have some new folks with us, is we want to cut through the noise because there is just so much information and then so much not quite right information (laughs) either that we get inundated with. And so our goal is to really speak for the working voice actors and have an expert. And we do, we do value you and your credibility and your uh, master plan to put you in that position. And so we appreciate your opinion on that. Um, so just to circle back, we had one question pop through that said, are you, is it cool to do a personalized yet templated email? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. I think where uh, you got to be, when, whenever you're talking about personalizing a template, you have to be smart about it, right? Uh, and I think the, the mistake that most people make when they start down that road is they try to get too personalized. I don't mean personal, I mean personalized, right? So they set up, you know, dear first name, which is fine. Then they'll say, I notice you're a job title at company. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that yeah. might work for the first few people you send it to. But remember, the data that you pick up from LinkedIn or any searchable database is not always going to be perfect. Right. And when somebody, t- you know, in their in their LinkedIn profile where it says job title, if somebody puts in there, I'm a wonderful producer, then your email is going to read, Dear Bob, I noticed you're a I'm a wonderful producer at Bob's company, right? So personalization can get really clunky. The best way to do it is to keep it simple, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, a personalized template is that the template is what allows you to do this quickly. And the personalization is, is what allows you to make it personal and human and friendly and approachable. All right. Let me squeeze in two more questions before our halfway point. This has been amazing so far. Uh, any tips on subject lines? I know that's, you, you know, not only do we need to craft the email, but we need to get them to open it. <laughs> Is yep. there any tips on that? Yeah, uh, there's two sort of little tricky, tippy tricks that uh, that seem to work rather well. One is to include the person's name. Okay. Uh, and, and the second is, and you can't do this every single time because you can go to the well too often. And it sounds really patterny and salesy, but uh, to sometimes ask a question. Questions tend to get slightly higher open rates than statements or okay. other phrasing. Um, but again, it's it's about being compelling. And so, if you're going to research uh, a market segment, let's say I, I don't know uh, medical video producers, then you're going to research that segment and you're going to figure out what you know, some of the common problems that medical video producers have when they're doing their job and you're going to address those. I gotcha. Uh, find the so, pain. Yep, yeah. Find I gotcha. the pain and address it in the subject line. Okay. That that's actually uh, very helpful. One more question before we cut to the halfway point. Do you find there are seasons that that's my word for direct marketing? Like for example, we don't necessarily want to be dis- marketing on December 25th, but Maybe we do, but do you find that there are seasons to direct marketing? Uh, generally, the heavy season I find is between January 1st and December 31st. Uh, <laughs> that's where most of my business comes in. And I've done extensive research on this, Jen, and, and almost, it's crazy, almost 100% of my business comes in between those two days. Every freaking day. That's the Every season. Year. I got well, it. Well, yeah, you take the holidays off, right? And and you want to treat the holiday seasons with respect. Um, and you know, look, there's there's people will say to me, like this question on. Well, people say you shouldn't uh, 
you know, open rates are down on Mondays, so you shouldn't send email on Mondays. Yeah. Well, yes, open rates are down, but why would you not send an email on a Monday? Right. right? Like, okay, if if you're getting, uh, you know, fifty uh, percent open rate the rest of the week, and you're getting forty five on Monday, does that really mean you don't want to send emails on Mondays? Uh, no, it doesn't. So generally, yes, you're going to market all year long, okay. but obviously you're going to be sensitive to holidays. You're going to be sensitive to, you know, whatever it might be. If there's a, a natural disaster in a given area, you're going to want to suspend your marketing in that area or at least be sensitive to it. Right. Right. Okay. All right. JT. All right. It looks like we're at the half hour, which flew by my goodness. Let's do a quick room reset. If you have just joined us, we are v- VO, mm-hmm, VO Booth Besties. Our goal is to help working voice actors get their most important questions answered by pros who know. Today, we're joined by Paul Schmidt, VO talent and business and marketing coach, discussing taking control of your VO career by using direct marketing to grow your business. If you have any questions for Paul, please drop them in the chat. Thanks for joining us, and let's get back to the interview. NJ? All right, before we continue, A.B., I know we've got questions in the chat, so just, just go. Just start. I forgot to unmute my mic for a second. Okay, Paul, so Hi. some of the questions. Hey. All right, first of all, how do you suggest we stay top of mind without getting annoying? What is the balance? Two words, provide value, right? I think a lot of times we fall into this uh, sort of ASCII baggy sort of messaging. Uh, I see it on social media and I know it happens in email too, where uh, you, you've got some thinly veiled excuse to go, hey, I'm still here. I'm out here. Can I have a, can you, can you, can you throw me a little bone? Right. And that's mm-hmm. not, never where we want to come from. Uh, we never want to come, up, come from a place of asking or begging for work. We want to come from a place of, I understand your problem and I'm here to solve it when you're ready to reach out. And so following up is really providing value in that arena, right? Again, going back to the example of healthcare video producer, right? Find out what kind of material they consume, consume it yourself and start to begin to understand their problem. And then, you know, when you run across a blog post that might resonate with that video, uh, that healthcare video producer, send it to them with a couple of bullet points. Hey, Bob, you know, saw this article in blah, blah, blah magazine uh, and thought of you. And here's why. Point A, point B, point C. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And we'll talk to you soon. Now okay. you're a consultant. You're, you're not, you're not. Hi, Bob. It's your friendly local voice actor. I was just wondering, hey, you have any work for me? <laughs> right? Because that just comes off as beggy and ASCII and annoying. And that's, you know, when I. I did research before I, I, I started the, the VO Freedom Master Plan because I was trying to figure out what was holding us back as a group, right? We're reaching out to less than three people a day as a group, as a group, right? And I don't know any business in the world that you can talk to two people a day and expect to be successful. And so I try, tried to get to the bottom of this. And, and one of the things was people are petrified that don't have a sales and marketing background of that very thing. They don't want to be annoying. They don't want to be manipulative. They don't want to have an agenda. They don't want to sell people. And I totally understand that. But here's the secret. The world's best salespeople are not annoying. They're not manipulative. They come from a place of service. They come from a place of, I am trying to help you solve your problem. Let's have a conversation about it. And that's it. Yeah, I love that. Come from a place of service. I think that we often believe that we need them, but if you go in if you go into it believing they need you and you're there to serve them, it changes things, doesn't it? Absolutely. It not only changes things from a business perspective, try it in the booth. Right? Yeah. Try and make that flip in the booth and go, you know what? They need me to solve this problem. Let me just crush this thing. I love that. That that totally can change your perspective. Um So Xavier Paul has a question. He says, can diversity be used as a selling point in a marketing email for VO, especially for VO performers of color, particularly if their problem is a lack of diversity in their VO talent hiring? How would you approach that? So this is coming from a 55-year-old white guy. So for whatever this is worth, right? And and this is, so this is in, in a large part, a highly unqualified opinion. 
I think diversity in VO is a magnificent thing, number one. Uh, I think that it is trending to be more diverse, more female, uh, more inclusive of not only people of color, but people of all sorts of, you know, we now have a gender spectrum that we didn't have years and years ago. And I think it's all fantastic. And I think in large part, and we still have a way, 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 way long to go. But in large part, there's been a shift away from guys that look and sound like me, right? Middle-aged to older white dudes who were announcers for years, right? We've, we've gotten away from that, that sort of paradigm. And I think it's fantastic. It makes me have to be better. I'll tell you that. Um, as to how to appeal to that, I think there's, I don't know the answer. But I think, first of all, if you are a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a person uh, maybe not on either of the traditional, in either of the, you don't identify traditionally male or female, you may be non-binary, all of that goes into your marketing, right? Your choices. For example, if you're a black woman, uh, for me as a white guy, I put my face on my marketing. I, I think it makes me more human makes me more approachable, makes me friendlier. But if I were a black woman, let's say, it may subject me to racism. It may subject me to misogyny or other forms of hatred. And so the the choice to put your identity into your marketing and how much you do that is entirely personal. And nobody owns that choice but you. How you choose to market yourself is is a very personal choice and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna dither with you either way no matter what you choose uh as far as being able to market to it sounds like xavier's asking should i try and educate companies on diversity and i think while that's extremely noble i don't think it's effective as a marketer and here's why i had a, uh, a sales coach years ago tell me look you know you're trying to find likely buyers. If you have to convince them why they should use human voiceover, that's a battle you don't have time to fight, right? So, because again, we're trying to build relationships here. Now, if you have that kind of time and that kind of bandwidth, Xavier, and you choose to you know, try and take an initiative to, uh, to, to teach companies to be more diverse, that's, that's a cultural shift that is like trying to turn a battlefield. And it's noble, but it's very slow. So I would caution you about that. I hope I answered Xavier's question. I think that that was I, I, my biggest takeaway from that is how you choose to market yourself as a personal choice, you know? And, Absolutely. Is. And it's, I think it's good to know the things that make us stand out and utilize them as we, as we feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, okay. How do you use a scheduler? So your email doesn't hit outside of business hours or do you just send it out and hope for the best? Uh, it's more important that you send it out than when you send it out. What I tried to do when I was building my business, still part-time trying to go full-time was the, one of the reasons that I chose email was I could schedule it for later to go out during normal business hours. I tried to do it later in the day uh, between, for example, I'm on the East Coast. So I would schedule it to go out between eight, nine o'clock so that I would be top of the inbox when they got in, right? Uh, I don't know that that's that important. I think you're splitting hairs at that point. I think you can send marketing emails any time of day. Uh, but um, it's more important that you send them than when you send them. The other consideration is, too, like I said, I'm East Coast. My business hours are 8 to 5 generally, right? But if I market to somebody in the UK or if I market to somebody in Asia or if I market to somebody in California, they're all in different time zones. And so... Um, you know, you can't, you can't, I mean, if you spend all your time trying to split hairs, you're never going to get your marketing out the door. At some point, it's got to go out. So I, again, I think it's more important that you send them out rather than when. Love it. And NJ mentioned um, local marketing. What are your thoughts on going out in person now that people are starting to have networking events again? Is that something that you utilize for your direct marketing, like going and shaking hands with people in your community? I do, but it's more to build relationships in the community. It's not to find work, right? right. So, because again, my local market, I'm in Richmond, Virginia, uh, which is about eh, a million people in the metro. That's not going to support me. It just isn't. Um, 
And so, yes, it's important to me to build local relationships. I have relationships with the studios here and I do get occasional work from them. And I have built friendships there um, because it enriches my life. It doesn't always enrich my business. And that's okay. Um, You know, I think, you know, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's realistic to expect your home market to support you again, unless you're in New York or L.A. Awesome. I think the last question we have from the chat, unless y'all want to throw some more out there, is um, do you use vacations and holidays to loop clients back in? We've heard that technique kind of being thrown out like, oh, it's you're going on vacation. So pull all, send an email out to all your clients and say, by the way, I'm going to be out of the office. Absolutely. For clients, agents, uh, folks like that. Yeah. Uh, and I do a monthly booked out uh, memo. Right. Uh, these are the dates this month. I won't be available. Uh, and that's just a great way to stay in front of them. It's a service for them. Uh, you're not going to spend a lot of time in it. You're not going to beg and ask for work. You're just saying, hey, uh, you know, love our relationship, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, welcome to June. I'm going to be unavailable on uh, from the 18th to the 22nd this month. Thanks so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out. Right. That's a great way to keep that relationship alive once a month. Yeah, that's really smart. Um Keeps you top of mind, if nothing else. Keeps you top of mind and it keeps you from surprising people, right? Yeah. Uh, when when they come up with a project on the 17th and they go, oh, you know what? Paul's not available. Okay. Well, at least we know that now. Let's adjust the schedule so because we want Paul and uh, let's, you know, let's schedule this for the 25th, right? If you give people the information, chances are it's going to come back in your favor. All right. Also, a couple more questions. Um, Somebody said, making those connections, like I'm assuming she means local networking, can lead to referrals. Do you ask for referrals from people that you meet locally? Generally, I don't know. I mean, because, uh, again, your your local market is not enough to support you. Again, your time is so valuable. Every minute you spend uh, at a local networking event, and again, I think there's value in it, but not for building your voiceover business. Uh, necessarily. Certainly not at scale. Uh, Will you get business locally by building those relationships? Yes. But it will, if you do this right, be a drop in the bucket, right? Uh, I get a fine amount of work from Richmond. Uh, But in the end, it's probably a couple of grand a year for me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, it's, local is fine. Uh, it, It, and again, we live in our communities. We want to be great community members. We want to be stewards of our communities. But it is not, unless you're in New York or L.A. or Chicago, uh, maybe, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe Atlanta. I don't know. Um, it's not going to be a significant portion uh, of your of your income, I don't believe. Good point. I like the enriches my life, not always my business. That's a right. Great takeaway there. Okay, next question. Is it okay to mention your rates in an introductory email? Why? I mean, you know, you're trying to build a relationship. And the minute, you know, it, it when you start talking about rates is when they start talking about projects, right? Um, no, you're just trying to build a relationship and start to be top of mind. When a project comes up, now it's time to start talking about rates and budgets. Uh, but not until then, right? It's like going out on a first date and talking about sleeping together. You know, you don't want to, you know, if you're gonna, if there's a time and place and you're not there yet. Love it. Love it. Yes. I, I hate to talk about rates, so I never bring that up until I absolutely have to. Um, okay. Next, let's see. I'm making sure we've covered all of them. Uh... Well, while you're looking, I'm going to get Paul fired up here for a minute because he Go hasn't gotten nearly fired up enough during this interview. <laughs> So one of the things I already know this and one, cause you know, I, and you know this about me that I help voice actors with their branding, but branding, and I'm going to use the L word logos, all mm-hmm. of these things, people correlate with marketing, but they actually, you don't need them to start marketing yourself. Can no, you, you do not. Can you speak to that please? Cause people, get, uh, they, they get their checklist going, Paul. Well, gotta have no okay, Kate. Nope, need to do that. Needed, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, but you're not now. You're not doing anything. You're, right. you know, yeah, yeah. You spend all day preparing to go out and exactly work without ever actually exactly doing it. yeah. Um, you know, I still to this day don't have a logo. 
Um, and if you look at my website, you'll, you'll under, I mean, you will see that I don't have a logo. A logo does not provide you, uh, people want logos because they think it makes them look bigger and more credible than they really are. And I understand that need and that desire. But the fact is they, they, they don't because in our business, your competency is demonstrated by your demo and by your audition. And your the, the experience of working with you is demonstrated by the social proof that you provide, the testimonials and the quotes and things like that. Uh, a logo doesn't mean shit. You know, so voice actor can have a really great logo and still be a crappy voice actor. So it doesn't provide any real credibility. Branding to me, uh, I understand how people perceive branding, but branding to me is simply consistency and uh, professionalism in presentation. It's got to look like you, right? However you define that, whatever colors you use, whatever font you use, great. I think there is a contingent in our business that, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't know where it comes from. I think it's true in a lot of businesses. Everybody wants a snappy little tagline and a, you know, a fancy, little, pardon me, a little logo. And it, it just, it's not going to differentiate you. It's not going to set you apart. Put your effort and your time and your blood, sweat, and tears, please, into your demos, into be getting good at your craft, into your auditions. Um, and yes, when it comes time to do things like a website, partner with somebody who knows what they're doing, right? Partner with somebody who knows how to design websites. So partner with somebody that knows a little bit about typ typography and, and user interactions. Um, but please, just don't try to do too much of this yourself unless that is absolutely the only alternative you have. No, I love that. And again, I appreciate your candor and I know your experience. Um, that's that this is why you're here today. And I know you can speak to that. So I think it also, to be perfectly honest, we, we, I say the big, we, we heap so much on actors to be, you know, again, I talk about this checklist, this, this, this ambiguous, like we made it up, like who made up this, you know, the who, who made up this checklist? They did. Well, who's they, <laughs> you know, right, so right. we, we lump all of these, these things into it and, and, and then we rush it and, and we're like, okay, well, I gotta get the, I gotta do this and I gotta do the brand, all the things and the website. And then, and then you look and you, you nailed it at the beginning of the interview and you said, yeah, and now you go to share who you are you're putting yourself out there and they go look at your website and it looks like your 12 year old built it. Right. All of a sudden you, it's like you've just shot yourself in the foot, just yep. trying to do too much too fast rather than just crushing it with your voice, your audition and your demo. You just, you just nailed it. And so I really, really appreciate that. Okay. AB, Thanks. was there something else before we. Yes. So Jim Cooper wanted to know, what makes your VO marketing plan different? How does it different from other marketing plans in the community? Well, I'm going to have to get a quick check out to Jim in, in a very large sum. <laughs> Jim is actually one of our students. And so Jim, Jim's feeding me a softball question there. And I certainly appreciate it, Jim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and there are actually, there's a couple of our students in the room. I thought I saw Jay Walter here earlier. Teresa Ho is here. She's in our program. Um, and I'm just looking quickly to see if I can see anybody else. Uh, but what makes this, makes the VO Freedom Master Plan different is a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, I did my research. I, I understood that there was a link between we don't reach out to people and we don't make any money as, as a group, as voice actors. And so I spent months digging into this. I talked to 69 voice actors over the course of 75 days to figure out you know, what's the deal. Why, why are we so hesitant slash fearful slash petrified to, to reach out to people to start conversations around their needs and our service offerings, right? Um, and so I did a ton of research and I learned a number of things in that research. I learned that money is not the primary driver for voice actors. It's freedom and flexibility, hence the name of the program, Rio Freedom Master Plan. People want the freedom to do the kind of work that they want to do when they want to do it, right? At the hours they want to do it. They want to work in the genres that they enjoy. They want to work with the kind of people that they like to work with, right? They, uh, they want to be able to work, make that successful business work 
within the context of a successful life. This idea of flexibility uh, really draws people to voiceover, right? I, every morning that my, my son is with me, I take him to school and I pick him up, right? I have that flexibility because I'm in this business and I have a successful business, right? I tell people I live like a millionaire because I have so much freedom and flexibility. It's crazy, right? So I really feel like I have a lot more freedom and flexibility than most millionaires. So uh, I did my research, number one. Number two, I tested this program against 25 voice actors. We rolled it out last spring and I did it live over Zoom. And if you don't think that wasn't petrifying, <laughs> it certainly was. Um, but I needed that immediate feedback. I needed people to say, hey, whoa, Paul, slow down. This slide right here doesn't make any sense to me, right? Walk me through this like I'm five. And so we took all of that live feedback. And then we also had post-session feedback where people could sit with that session for a couple of days and go, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, that doesn't make any sense to me either. And we baked all of that into the curriculum as it is now. I also didn't stop there. I partnered with a consultant, a guy named Paul Walsh. And Paul, for the last almost decade, has been the online and distance learning program manager for the entire University of Maryland college system. So this is what he and his team do. They make sure that online curricula are effective, that students are actually learning what the course intends to teach. And Paul went through all of our content with a fine tooth comb and added so much to it. Things like much more frequent assessments and quizzes, things like guides and resources and worksheets to support the curriculum that was already there. And again, he's, he and his team do this on a university level. So we're highly, highly uh, confident in the, in the curriculum as a learning tool uh, because I was not a professional educator. I needed to pull somebody in that really knew what they were doing, especially from an online and distance learning perspective. So that's, uh, that's what sets us apart. And, and, and thirdly, the fact that this program, the VO Freedom Master Plan, is life, you know, it's lifelong. Once you're in, you're in. It's like the mafia. You can't really get out. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you can, but you don't want, you don't want to take that route. Uh, it's a lifetime membership to the curriculum, uh, to the online support community. Uh, we have a, a great community of, of, of members only, students only that support each other. Right. So when you have a problem or an obstacle, you know, you might have half a dozen, half a dozen other people that'll chime in and go, hey, Jen, I had that same problem. And here's how I solved it. Right. So it's not just me, you know, it's not Paul Schmidt standing on top of a mountain pontificating. It's people that are in the trenches with you that are a little bit further ahead that uh, have adapted the program for their own businesses and now have qualified real world information to help you with. Right. So I think those things set our program apart quite a bit. That sounds awesome. So thanks for that softball, Jim. And he gets lots of good testimonials. <laughs> as well, that we do. Supporting that it. we do. Well, and that's one thing we teach our students too: is social proof is one of the one of the currencies you're going to use to help find work because that's the that's the way that people are initially going to come to understand what it's like to work with you, not what your product is like, but what's the experience of working with Jen Greenfield, uh -huh. right? Wow, mm -hmm. Jen's really fun to work with, man. She turned everything around in a in a snap. Came in on budget and God, she was a blast. Right? Yeah. That's, that's currency that you can use to go out and find more work. And you've got to actively collect it. Yeah. Well, blah, wow. Okay. So much, so much, so much juicy stuff. And we're not even paying for it, guys. Paul is volunteering his time and giving hey, away information. It's amazing. Hey, Jen, well, can I use that quote? Blah. Yes, I'll spell it out for you. Um, I'll make sure I make a cute little graphic. Uh, okay. NJ, so guys, do, we have, do we have time oh, for one more question? Yeah, let's squeeze. Yeah, we do. Let's squeeze it in. Like we've got five minutes, right? Okay. Because we we'll save this to the end because I have a feeling you have some thoughts on this, Paul. Uh, what are your thoughts on utilizing pay to plays as a marketing technique? You're getting in front of someone, right? As yep. Someone has told me, do you think that they read those little notes? Does it, does it actually give you a good shot or is it useless? So there are certain situations I think the play, pay to plays make a lot of sense. 
uh, there, if you go to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash at Paul Schmidt Pro, there's a video called Smart P2P. And, and I kind of go through these scenarios. One of the, the smartest ways you can use P2P is when you're brand new because you need a source of auditions and you need to get your audition process down. And so this is a way to get, you know, in air quotes, real world auditions because they are. Uh, and to be able to have sort of that game day pressure behind them so that you can take your uh, your auditioning process, maybe down from, you know, when you start out and you're green, it might take you half an hour to crank out a good audition. You're going to need to get that down to, you know, five, six, seven minutes, right, to be able to read the spec, understand it, break down the copy, go in the booth, do a few takes, come out, cut it all together, get the proposal out the door with the audio. Right. If you can do 12 of those an hour, you're hauling. Right. But you can't do two an hour because now you're going to be there all day. Uh, so I think getting your audition processes down, I think pay to plays are a great way to do that. I think pay to plays are fine as long as you're not reliant upon them. Right. Mm. But we've seen any of these platforms can change the rules at any given time. And that leaves you highly, highly vulnerable as a business person. Because you don't own those relationships. The platform does. Now, on some platforms, you can start to work offline with clients. And I think that's great. Others, you can't. And they can change the algorithm. They can change the rules. They can change anything at any time. And you have absolutely no say over that. And it leaves you vulnerable. So I think there's uh, there are certain ways to use the pay-to-place smartly. They should be, you know, I hate the cheesy metaphor, but I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> They should be one arrow in your quiver and you should have lots of arrows in your quiver. Love it. All right, NJ. Well, we've done it, guys. We have made it to an hour. And Paul, this has been absolutely phenomenal. And we're so glad you joined us. Um, before you go, we like to ask our guests three for fun questions. Uh, a little James Lipton style. Or I should say Jim <laughs> Cooper down there. I should say Jim Cooper style. I'm going to change it. Um, so here we go. What singer, band, or composer are you enjoying right now? Oh, uh, singer, band, or composer. I, the thing, wow, the thing that I'm really grooving on right now is neither of those. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not music. It's actually, um, I'm delving back into, I read it when I was a kid. I'm delving back into, um, the Stoic, Marcus Aurelius, yes. uh, Meditations. And I'm, oh, I'm, wow. I'm rereading Meditations right now, and it's kind of blowing my mind. So, okay. my news my newsletter subscribers are about to get really tired of Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> okay, we know what you're drawing from. Okay, well, are you listening to any podcasts? Because that's our second question. Uh, the Well, actually, one of the newer podcasts that I'm listening to is Jim Cooper's called The Hydrant. Uh, and Jim has, uh, it's a little bit templated in, in that he's got, you know, some set questions that he asks you. But I'm telling you, he asked me some of the toughest questions I've ever been asked in an interview in my entire life. And I loved it. It was fantastic. So I'm a big right. fan of Jim's podcast he, as well. He tossed the softball back, Jim. So you guys are just <laughs> having a little a little soft game of catch here. And I love yeah. it. I love Jim. You know, and I, Paul, I really enjoyed your interview. And Yolanda Spearman, I listened to her today. And she and I were chatting on LinkedIn, actually, because I was like, oh, my gosh, we need to be best friends because <laughs> she is the That best. woman is a oh. force of nature. She is awesome. Holy mackerel. She's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim, I didn't say anything, Jim. I'm letting you say it, but um, I'm coming up. Jim and I happened to do one too. It was going to, it's nice. going to be, it'll be um, entertaining. Okay. So <laughs> podcast, I'm being subtle. Uh, okay. And the last question, Paul, what is your favorite dessert? Oh man. If you held a gun to my head, I, I, I would say any dessert, but uh, if you really held a gun to my head, I'd have to say cheesecake. Okay. Mm. Excellent. All right. AB, you're up. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, thank, I, thanks like to the three of you. Yeah. Uh, thanks to the three of you. And thanks to everybody that like took time out uh, on a weeknight to, to join, you know, the, the ramblings of, you know, me. 
Uh, and hopefully you guys got something out of it. And I want to let everybody know that if you, you know, if, if I said something that didn't make sense or anything, and you want to reach out to me, I'm on all the socials. Uh, you can find me at Paul Schmidt Pro just about anywhere, and I'd be happy to answer questions or whatever you need. So. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I uh, I took a whole page notes, so obviously there was some good stuff in there, um, at least for me. Uh, we also want to make sure everybody checks the link pinned to the top of our page before you head out. There's the um, link to our fundraiser. Our whole purpose in starting VOBB is to support the VO community. Uh, everything here is free. We, we are not charging for any of this. There's no memberships. Um, it, I mean, you're a member just you don't have to pay for it, right? <laughs> so with the support of Tim Friedlander and NAVA, the National Association of Voice Actors, we're hosting this fundraiser um, now through February 20th. And all proceeds, every penny goes to NAVA for scholarships for voice actors to attend conferences, et cetera. So oh, that's fantastic. Check I'm it, it out and you get a cute shirt or an I awesome am. shirt. Cute's the wrong. It, I think they're cool. I like them. I have ordered one for everyone in my family. Long sleeve hoodies. Yeah, we got it all coming. Nice. <laughs> nice. I'm on it now. Awesome. Thanks. Um, we're also excited to share that next week, our guest speaker is Danny States. She's going to be talking to us about CRMs and understanding business metrics. Paul touched on the importance of a CRM earlier tonight. And that is also something that completely eludes me. And um, so Danny will be here to help us get that all straightened out. You can head over to boothbesties.com to submit any questions that you have for Danny for next week, and we'll be sure to include them in our interview. And also keep the conversation going. Connect with each of us on LinkedIn. Follow VOBB on Facebook and Instagram. And NJ, you had one more thing? Yeah, and guys, the house, which you know, I know this is all new to us and we're all figuring it out. This is our public room, which we host each Monday and now also a Thursday for VO101. Uh, so it's a fundamentals room. But the house is separate. And guys, you can literally leave here, go hop into the house, open a room, chit chat, talk about anything you want. But certainly you can keep the conversation going if you want to talk about marketing, what's working for you. You can freely do that over in the house. And that's it. So I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the evening. Replays are on. And you can also catch us on our podcast, which you can find at boothbesties.com. So good night, everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of VO Booth Besties. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Well, pretty much anywhere they're playing podcasts. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook so we can keep the conversation going. VO Booth Besties. Yeah, it's a thing.